This is Liberty Hill, a small fresh water town where the streets are named for trees and heroes and a sense of life's continuity runs in the air. It is like a hundred other American towns, smug and cozy and putting a special stamp upon its own. People born and raised here, high and low, rich and poor, our neighbors in an irrevocable way. They have all, for the space of a whole generation, been exposed at a tender and malleable age to the impartial justice, the inflexible regulations, and the gray, calm, neutral eyes of the same teacher, the terrible Miss Dove. you are using on your lilies? The sulfate of ammonia, best fertilizer on the market. Except for lilies, Mr. Porter. Particularly for lilies, Miss Dove. They will perish. There she goes, Jensie. Fifteen minutes past eight, right in the dock. <laughs> I wish little who's it, the slowpoke, would copy Miss Dove and develop a sense of time. But who could stand the strain? Imagine burping a baby that in any way resembled the terrible Miss Dove. <laughs> Seventeen minutes past eight. Eat your oatmeal, Davy, dear. Miss Dove just went by. You don't want to be tardy. Oh, puke. The oatmeal stinks. Then excuse yourself and get off to school. Yes, sir. Excuse me. Go on. Good morning, Miss Dove. Good morning, Mr. Levine. Our Maury is coming home today to pay us a visit. Naturally, he will want to see his old teacher. I shall be happy to see Maurice. Good morning, Miss Dove. Good morning, William. Peggy, how's my best girl? Hi. Atta girl. Well, well, little sister. Why, what a pretty pink dress. It's ours, Mrs. Susie. My mother made it. She did. Hi. Isn't he cute, the small fry? He ought to have just oodles and dozens of his own. I mean, it's a shame such a family man never married. Good morning, Miss Dove. Good morning, Mr. Susie. John, send me a fast one. Oh, nice try, Mr. Stubby. Lucky caddy for you. Oh, please don't bother, Miss Elwood. Spring's certainly in the air. Boys playing baseball, state proficiency test coming up. Say, is old Cedar Grove going after the geography pennant again this year? The children will do their best. I trust the results will reflect credit on all concerned. I heard what you said about spring, Mr. Stubby. Isn't this just the most blood-tingling day? Makes you want to do something utterly mad. <laughs> Good morning, Robert. Good morning, Miss Dove. Good morning, Mark. I forgot my handkerchief. First things first, Harrison. Good morning, Miss Dove. Good morning, Harrison. You may provide yourself with the tissue from the box on my desk. Good morning, Miss Dove. Good morning, Margaret. Good morning, Miss Dove. Good morning, Milas. <laughs> Attention, please. The lesson will begin. We will continue with our study of the dietary habits of animals. Bears like honey. 
They are also fond of red ants, which have a flavor similar to that of pickles. Robert. You know what to do, Robert. You may return to your desk, Robert. We will resume. The camel is not a pretty beast, but he can go many days without water. Margaret, for the remainder of the class, you will occupy the posture correction stool. Hey, you better tank up. The camel is not a pretty beast, but he can go many days without water. Ah, oh, who's afraid of that old stick? Good morning, Mr. Good morning, David. The proficiency test prepared by the State Board of Education will be held next Monday. Therefore, I think it would be advisable to utilize this period for review. No, David. You had ample opportunity to quench your thirst before the beginning of class. Take out your books, please. I advise that you memorize the agricultural products of the Argentine Pampas. Strange, sharp pain. Probably a muscular spasm. If I tranquilize my mind, it will pass. I will think about the Alps, white, clean, rising above Lake Lucerne. Come back, Victoria. Hellfire and damnation! You will remain after class, David. Yes, Miss Dove. Open your notebook to a blank page. You will copy that sentence 20 times. You mean before lunch? By the time you have finished, the cafeteria will still be open. David? Yes, Miss Dunn? Is your father likely to be home? But I'm doing the sentences, Miss Dove. Answer my question, David. Your father, does he come home for lunch? Yes, Miss Dove. Daddy's home. I am indisposed, David. I... I am ill. Will you go and tell your father? Ask him to call young Dr. Hurley. Mention this to no one. David, do not loiter. Run. I'll take the shortcut to the vacant lot where the old bank used to be. Where the old bank used to be.
from school? Good afternoon, Mrs. Aldridge. I returned this morning. Good, we missed you. Welcome home, my dear. Nice to see you. Thank you, Dr. Hurley. It's nice to see you. And how is young Dr. Hurley? The lad celebrated his 45th birthday yesterday. His 45th? Yes. Uh, Look at her, John. By Jove, hasn't she something that sets her apart? It's like the delicate glaze that is the difference between fine porcelain and ordinary wear. Well, that Miss Watson Ames school on the Hudson should have given her something. It certainly cost enough. Not half as much as it cost your father to send you to Harrow and Oxford. But money has nothing to do with it. Quality can't be given nor purchased. That girl was born to do anything at all. Whatever she does become is certain to be remarkable. As a father, you could be prejudiced. But then you could also be right. <laughs> Welcome home. Thank you, sir. It's pleasant to see you, Mr. Porter. The feeling is mutual. I hope Mrs. Porter is in good health. She is, and most anxious to see you. Told me to find out when you and your father can come to dinner. Of course, it doesn't have to be your father. I expect you met some dashing young men while you were away from Liberty Hill. Uh, yes, sir. I met one that I like very much. What's that? You'd like him too, Papa. He's an archaeology major at Princeton. Tell me about it later. Right now, I have a surprise. In the mail this morning from my London dealer, after being on its trail for eight years, that elusive edition of Marco Polo's travels. Oh, I know how happy you are, but you haven't even opened it. So that I might share it with you tonight, after dinner. <laughs> then let's go home. Dinner can be early. May we give you a ride, Mr. Porter? Thank you, no. I still have some things to attend to. It's the first of the month. <laughs> See you tomorrow, John. Uh, while you're about it, send a draft for the book. Two hundred dollars. If they'd only known, I was ready to go to five. <laughs> Thirteenth century Venice to old Cathay. What a time to have lived. Next year, I've made up my mind, we'll make a tour. The grandest of grand tours. I'll show you every corner of the world. Last summer, Mr. Pendleton rode a bicycle all through Greece. Mr. Pendleton? Who's Mr. Pendleton? Oh, Papa, you never listen. He's the young man from Princeton I told you about. Oh, yes, the archaeologist. His name is Welford Banning Pendleton III. Lovely, my dear. Mr. Pendleton wrote me a letter. He asked leave to visit me this summer, here in Liberty Hill. It's too late for Dr. Hurley, Miss Dove. is here, sir. Have her come in, please. Thank you for coming. Won't you please sit down? What I must tell you is as painful to me as it will be for you. I should like to have put it off, but... Uh, tell me, Mr. Porter. Your father availed himself of some of the bank's assets without first observing the conventional forms. He stole? Are you saying that my father stole? Let us say he borrowed. How much, Mr. Porter? Eleven thousand four hundred and thirty dollars, to be exact, in dribbles here and there. No more than he could have hoped to return one day. Eleven thousand four hundred and thirty dollars? This must be repaid. At once. By whom? By me, of course. There's the house, the the rare editions, the, the paintings. 
Their disposal will more than cover my father's indebtedness. Unfortunately, it won't be as simple as that. I've been going over your father's books. The house, all his possessions are mortgaged to the hilt. Miss Dull, your father was one of my closest friends. Were I financially able, I would happily cover this indebtedness to the bank before there's any scandal. Scandal? There must be no scandal. I don't see how it can be avoided. Can't the bank make over to me this deficit a as a personal loan until I can repay it? You? But how could you repay it? I, I shall secure employment. A position. A teaching position. A teaching position? My dear child, what are you prepared to teach? I know a great deal about the world. I cannot imagine a young lady who knows less. I should have been more explicit. Not about the world, the earth. I have read my father's books. I could find my way through Carthage, were it to rise again. I can point out on a map of Iowa every field where the corn grows tallest. I know every turn of the Nile, every eddy of the Mississippi. I am not even certain, should I put my mind to it, that I couldn't locate the Northwest Passage. I am superbly qualified to teach geography, Mr. Porter, and I will teach geography. There will be no scandal, and I will repay my father's debt. You are now president of this bank. Surely you can arrange somehow a, a personal loan? Well, I'll, I'll try, since you seem so determined, but... I really can't guarantee anything. Thank you. Meanwhile, I, I will make my application to the school board. Good morning, Mr. Porter. Is there anything you wish, Mr. Porter? Yes. Get me the superintendent of schools. Yes, sir. Dear Mr. Pendleton, the news that you have been awarded a fellowship by the Carnegie Foundation is most gratifying. Much to my regret, the death of my father will prevent my receiving you this sum. Mail, Mr. Pendleton. Thank you, Ames. I took the liberty. I had to express my sympathy in person. Please come in, Mr. Pendleton. Now that I'm here, there, there's so little I can say. You've said it very well, Mr. Pendleton. suppose you'd care to. No. But I should like to call you Welford. Thank you. Just what does the Carnegie Fellowship mean, Welford? A full year in Tibet with the Archer Expedition. Tibet? You'll see the Himalayas. 
We'll sail down the Brahmaputra, then Lhasa. Lhasa. One of the oldest cities in the history of men. And on to Shigatse and the Sacred Lakes. Wait. I know their names. Mansarawa and Roxdale. Right. Then, then we'll follow the ancient route to, to Kashmir and the Tarim Basin. <sighs> Dependent and wealthy. How I envy you. I don't want you to envy me. I want you to come with me. Come with you? I know this must seem premature, but from the first moment we met at Miss Kingsley's weekly tea, I, I felt that our friendship, begun under such pleasant auspices, might ripen into something warmer. Remember, we, we left the others and strolled along the river. We sat on a marble bench, and you described the misty isles of Greece. We like the same things. Yes, we do. My assets are not impressive. I have a $1,500 grant from the foundation and $5,000 my grandmother lent me. But in, in all modesty, I feel I have a future in my chosen field. A bright future, Welford. An exciting future. Share it with me. Marry me. Marry me tomorrow. Today. Oh, let it ring. Oh, it, it will only keep on ringing. I'll be but a moment. Hello? Oh. Good afternoon, Mr. Porter. Everything's been been arranged. Yes, I. I am fortunate indeed. Will you thank the superintendent of schools? And thank you, Mr. Porter. Goodbye. I am afraid, Wilfred, that we we have been premature. <laughs> that we've let ourselves be carried away by the spell of far-off places. We have placed too much importance on the coincidence of similar interests. I'm asking you to marry me. I'm sorry, Wilfred, but my future is here. Here in Liberty Hill. There is someone else? There is something else. I, too, am about to embark on a career. Please wish me success in mine, as I do you in yours. I... Good afternoon, Welford. be honored by your proposal. David said you needed help, Miss Dunn. And so I brought Tommy. I requested young Dr. Hurley, my personal physician. Well, David told us that, but Dr. Hurley is ill with a recurrence of his bronchitis. The immoderate use of tobacco. An enslaving habit when formed early in life. Anyhow, Dr. Hurley is temporarily out of circulation. And I happened to be at Sandy's house picking up a bath and that when David came. But Thomas has had excellent training, you know. I do know. It's only that... I see your point, Miss Dove. To ask for a seasoned medical man and to be offered my services is like being sent a troop of Boy Scouts and one has requested the militia. Frankly, yes, Thomas. However, since you were kind enough to come, I shall be glad of your opinion. These are my symptoms. A pain at the base of my spine, sharp and spasmodic. A numbness in my right limb.
that so? Was it bad? Yes. And your right leg has a complete absence of sensation? My limb has gone to sleep. As soon as I move about but it... But that's what I can't allow. Did I understand you to say, can't allow? That's right. And pray, what is your diagnosis? I haven't one yet. I'll have to get you to the hospital and right away. I'm sure that is quite unnecessary. Young Dr. Hurley... He's flat on his back. Believe me, it is quite necessary. Next week, perhaps. At the moment, I cannot be spared. The state proficiency test... That's next week, not even tomorrow. Right away, now. The fifth grade is weak on the winds and the tides. I'm afraid the decision is not yours, Miss Dove. Yes, Thomas. My hat, please. My gloves and my bag. They are in the closet. I'll fetch them. I always admire that watch. Remember? Perfectly. I await your convenience, gentlemen. Now, if you'll just lean forward this way, support yourself on the desk. Now, Sandy. Yeah. OK. Sit down. Put your arms around our necks. That's right. You may go, David. Yes, mister. Sign straight, Miss Dove. Don't wobble about. It is not my custom to wobble. Low bridge. Forward march. David, pick up my things, will you? Yes, sir. Watch your steps. It might be too much of a jolt. I'll have to carry her. Think you can make it? Well, if you can't, chum, after all, I'm only three months your senior. What about Miss Duff? She'll do, so long as she keeps her spine rigid. Being neither absent nor deaf, and in complete command of my faculties, I should prefer not to be discussed in the third person. Our apologies, Miss Duff. And you have no objections. I defer to your judgment. You have defined my responsibility. I shall keep my spine rigid. Good. Accident, Doc? Is she bad off? The immediate situation's under control. But scoot over to the hospital and tell them I want a private room. Say I'm not asking for it, I'm telling them. Yes, sir. As I predicted. What did you say, Miss Dove? Nothing, Alexander. I am not one to gloat over an empty triumph. Spine rigid, Miss Dove. We're almost there. Right. 
Uh, though the circumstances are regrettable, we are honored, Miss Dove. Thank you, Mr. Pruitt. I have a special for tonight in case one is needed. A practical is the best I could do for day duty, but Mrs. Green is one of our very best. I try to be. Now what, Thomas? Mrs. Green knows what to do. Just keep her quiet. Yes, I certainly will, Dr. Baker. I'll look in on you a little later, Miss Dove. Oh, he has an appendectomy. Now, we're just going to relax, and we're going to have a good time. Uh, first, I guess I'd better get you to your room. That would seem advisable. Now, we'll take off our clothes, and then we'll feel more comfy. The pronoun we is misleading, unless you propose to take off your clothes, too. Oh. Don't you remember me, Miss Dove? I was Billy Jean McVeigh. Yes, Mrs. Green, I remember you very well. Of course, I'm older now. If you please, Mrs. Green, I am not totally incapacitated. Miss Dove, you are not to help or to exert yourself. Do you want me to tell Dr. Baker that you are a naughty girl? Something for after the bath to keep our skin soft and sweet. Uh, your skin, I mean. You know what I always think of when I put this on my patients? No, Mrs. Green. The little can of talcum you gave me for Christmas in the third grade. It was second grade. Girls in the third grade received thimbles. Mine had a picture of lilacs on it. I was some proud. And when you gave it to me, you said something I never forgot. You said, this is to use after you wash your neck. Well, I intended no reflection upon you, Mrs. Green. That is what I say to all the little girls. Oh, I didn't take it personal, but I certainly took it to heart. It's what I tell my baby, my little Ava. She's going on five. She's just crazy about my Mary Snow's country garden. But I tell her every time she begs for it, I say, first, you wash yourself good. Well... Yes, that's exactly what I tell her. What is my temperature? That's uh, confidential. Besides, even if I told you, you wouldn't know what it meant. It's in centigrade or something. It is neither in centigrade nor in something. It is Fahrenheit. Well, hey, gee, thanks. I better remember that. As to my question, it was indiscreet. Oh, no, not indiscreet a bit. All patients are snoopy. But, well, you know rules. Yes, Mrs. Green, I know rules. Well, now, I'll just stop yakking so you maybe can take a nice little nap. About that country garden, that, that perfume we were talking about, a gentleman friend that I was going steady with up to a month ago, he gave it to me. He said it smelled real refined. Mm. I was very happy in his company. It seemed to be mutual, but, well, it came to a dead end. I've been a widow now for five lonely years, as you no doubt have heard. Uh, I do not recall. You remember when I went way out west to Detroit to work in a factory? Well, out there I met Mr. Green. He, uh, he passed away shortly after. Hmm. So when I said that about being older, you see what I mean. But your life must be full. You have your work and your child. Yeah. Uh, you know Bill Holloway. Officer Holloway, I suppose I should refer to him. William was one of my pupils. Well, I just thought you might like to know how he's got you up on a pedestal. He says you're his idea of real genteel. I value William Holloway's opinion. Funny how he should have ended up the type he is. Why do you say that? Oh, I was just thinking about how he started out being raised by the old grandmother. Now, you know what she was, and living in that leaky shack down by the gas works. William Holloway started out with a gift rarer than mathematical genius or perfect pitch. A child in whom the ethical instinct was as innate as the function of breathing. Oh, brother. If anyone should ever tell him that, you could drive a truck right between his ears. There would be no point in apprising with him. He knows what he is. He always knew. The last desk in the third row. Oh, thank you. Come along. Good morning, Miss Dove. 
Our little Jackie. Good morning, Jacqueline. I want to go home. Oh, her daddy all over again. Awfully S-W-E-E-T when she wants to be and awfully B-A-D when she doesn't. I will conduct you to your desk, Jacqueline. Good morning, Mrs. Wood. Well, Miss Dove, if at first we don't succeed... Good morning, Mrs. Makepeace. Good morning, Frederick. Why, Freddie, where did they come from? Pepperdine's Market. But we weren't in... We picked them up as we passed so he could bring you a present. It's all right, Miss Dove. We have an understanding with Mr. Pepperdine. On the way back, I'll tell him to put them on the bill. Thank you, Frederick. However, I prefer that you do not make a habit of bringing me gifts. Dear, you heard Miss Dove. She doesn't want any more of Mr. Pepperdine's apples. Uh -huh. You may take the desk you had last year, Frederick. It isn't that he's backward, Miss Dove. It's only he doesn't take anything seriously. Would you please give him your special attention? All my pupils receive my special attention, Mrs. Makepeace. Is that child entering Cedar Grove? Apparently. Then I beg you, Miss Dove, keep Freddie on the other side of the room. Oh, I believe in democracy and all that, but I don't want him to catch anything. My seating arrangements are alphabetical, Mrs. Makepeace. But, Miss Dove, it's that Holloway child. Surely, Miss Dove, you know that boy's background. His grandmother is the most notorious... I am not interested in my pupils' backgrounds. I am interested in their basic traits of character. Good morning. I am Miss Dove, your geography teacher. I know your last name is Holloway, but I do not know your first name. It's Bill. Can I come to school? Most certainly, William. This is your desk. Good morning. Coffee done, Billy? I'm getting it for you now, Grandma. It'll be a cold day when Kelly's cheap joint sees me again, let me tell you. <clears throat> Insulting me in public. Taking away my credit just because I owe him a few lousy bucks. And then threatening to call the cops just because I give him a piece of my mind. <laughs> I bet you could hear me in the next county. <laughs> Where'd you get that from? The five and ten, Miss Schultz gave me a dime to go to the store. Ain't she got a nerve, considering her and me don't speak. Goodbye, Grandma, I gotta go now. Where are you rushing to? Now, if you can run errands for old lady Schultz, who's got two fat legs of her own, you can do a nice little job for your grandmother. No, I'll be late. Now, don't you stir a step. You just take them beer bottles in the yard and dump them. This is the day that nosy dame from the relief comes snooping around. Good morning, Miss Duff. Good morning, William. please your lunch William thank you Miss Duff drink all your milk William your work is most satisfactory and an additional honor, the Good Attendance Medal. This young man has a record unique in the annals of Cedar Grove. He has not been absent a single day in his six years of elementary school. My felicitations, William. I... I came to thank you for my graduation suit. It was my pleasure. Well, I guess I better be going. I shall watch where you go with interest, William. I have faith in you. 
It was always so clean in here. Like, like, like this was where I, I really lived. That's why I never missed a day. Goodbye, Miss Doug. Back with you. Do not worry about him. He will find his way. Poor old Annie. Wonder if she ever knew it was a beer truck that hit her. for my expressions of sympathy. Thank you, Miss Duff. She did the best she could. She didn't... She didn't have my opportunities. Her troubles are over. Will you be riding with me? Yeah. I should like to accompany you, William, if you wish. Thank you, Miss Duff. William Holloway, Private First Class. Corporal William Holloway. Hmm. Sergeant William Holloway. Thank you, Mr. O'Neill. These sure are, uh, they're delicious, Miss Dove. What's in them? Only bread and butter, William. When did you return? On the 345. I made a beeline straight from the station. Mainly because I wanted to see you. Also, I need your advice. I am honored, William. Well, this is how it shapes up. Uh, tomorrow I'm out of the Marines. I know it's pretty late. What would you think if I uh, use my GI educational allowance for living expenses and finish school? I should approve. And then what, William? Oh, well, this will throw you for a loop. I mean, surprise you. I've been thinking about entering the field of law enforcement. I'd like to be a first-rate cop. I mean, a good police officer. A worthy ambition, William. I shall continue to follow your career with interest. Thank you, Miss Dove. Miss Dove. Miss Dove. Here's Dr. Temple, Miss Dove. I'm Dr. Baker's house officer. You may report to Dr. Baker that I am presently comfortable, thank you. Excellent. That makes my task just that much easier. Your task? I'm to take your history. And so you can both speak more private. I'll wait in the hall. That will be quite unnecessary. Oh, it's custom, Miss Dove. Dr. Hurley has provided us with your records, childhood diseases, vital statistics, etc., so we can get down to the immediate. Do you suffer from periodic headaches? No, Dr. Temple. Are you afflicted with respiratory infections? No, nor am I subject to common colds. Any allergies? None. I consider them sheer affectation. I see. Is there a family history of epilepsy, night blindness, eczema, or melancholy? Certainly not. What about your emotional life? I beg your pardon. Well, love, you know. Any feelings of frustration, inadequacy? I have never felt inadequate question was routine. Supposing we call your emotional life satisfactory? That would be correct. Are you subject to fantasy? In other words, are there occasions when the world around you assumes an aura of unreality? Yes, Dr. Temple. Well, could you say approximately how long you've been conscious of these occasions? 
I can say definitely, since around 12 o'clock noon today. Oh, yeah. uh, Thank you, Miss Dove. Dr. Baker will be in later, of course. You know, you and I are really old friends. In a manner of speaking, I've known you all my life. You have known me? I'm Adams Temple. My mother was a Liberty Hill girl. Angela Adams, of course. I should have known. Well, it's been a long time. Mother's family moved to Maine when she was 14. But she remembers you. I remember her. She, too, had an inquiring mind. <laughs> yeah, she still has. As a matter of fact, it's her proudest boast that she's the only kid at Cedar Grove who ever asked you a question you couldn't answer. Indeed. As she tells it, it was way back in the first or second grade. You were reading from a book about the dietary habits of animals. And it said that bears liked honey and were also very fond of red ants, which have a flavor similar to that of pickles. And Mother asked you how the man who wrote the book knew how ants tasted. Did he eat an ant to find out, or did a bear tell him? <laughs> I recall the incident. I'm writing Mother tonight. She'll get a wallop out of this. I dare say. And I'll be looking in on you, and if there's anything at all I can do, I just buzz. One moment, Dr. Temple. You want Dr. Temple for something? Yes, for the courtesy of asking him a few questions. For all his volubility, he told me nothing of my physical condition. Well, he couldn't. He's not in charge. You're Dr. Baker's private patient. Then what is it? What is it Dr. Baker suspects? He'll tell you what you need to know. I see no occasion for mystery. Don't try to see. Let us do the thinking. You and Thomas Baker and Angela Adams' son will think for me? Well, sure. We're experienced. Oh, look, your first flowers. Bill Holloway, uh, Officer Holloway, left it at the desk. It is very beautiful. Good afternoon, Virginia. I didn't know you'd been admitted. I haven't. I came to see you. How are you, Miss Dow? Quite comfortable, Virginia. And you? <laughs> Wonderful, except the suspense is killing me. If nothing definite has happened by the end of the week, Dr. Tillett's promised to give nature a nudge. Right now, I suggest I keep walking. I better had. Tommy knew I was here to have a fit. Well, I, I just came up to wish you good luck. And good luck to you, Virginia. Thank you. I'm keeping my fingers crossed for both of us. Goodbye, Billy Jean. I know you'll take good care of her. Oh, I sure will. You know, I used to think she was the snootiest, dumbest brat in Liberty Hill. She's really a good kid. In marriage and maternity, Virginia has found her vocation, achieved her destiny. A year ago, I was not quite so hopeful. not be downhearted. There's always another season. Another crop of fresh little rookies coming up to bat. For six years, I pruned and polished them. I tried to blow into them the breath of purpose. 
I do not wish them back. I wish only to believe that they will do well without me. Good morning, Miss Dove. Good morning, Virginia. This was my place. You may sit there now, Virginia. The room is different. Empty. Like life. Is that the same map? Is China still orange? It is a new map. China is purple. Cartographically, of course. I like the old map. I like the old world. I felt secure in this room. I, I felt that if I obeyed the law and sneezed in my handkerchief and raised my hand for permission to speak and kept my margins neat, that that, that was my oyster. That nothing could go wrong. Well, at first it worked out all right. Even plunking out of the university seemed like, like fate. I won that talent contest and got a job in New York, singing television commercial. Oh, Miss Dove, tell me what to do. Do your duty. Well, what is your duty when your world is ended? You are 19, I believe. Well, what difference does that make? To understand, you've got to know how it was. I met him at the stork club when I'd only been in New York a week. He spoke to the waiter in French and he wore a cummerbund. Oh, he was everything that the paper said he was when we announced our engagement. Yale, a yacht, and the scion of a prominent family. Uh, the word is scion. The sea is silent. Yes, well, he looked just like what he was. Most sky, sky, uh, scions don't. Every night it was the stork club and the El Morocco and Colony and 21. Champagne and, and the kind of steaks that the waiter has to slice. Did you ever drink champagne, Miss Dove? No. It tastes just like cider, only the effect is different. I dare say. And the compliments that he paid to my hair and, and my eyes and my figure. <laughs> Honestly, I'm almost embarrassed to repeat them. A reticence, Virginia, is a sine qua non of gentility. Well, <clears throat> anyhow, I, I came home to Liberty Hill to prepare for my wedding. I wanted to be married here so all my friends could come. I was modeling my wedding dress when someone turned on the radio. And then everything went black. <laughs> the next day I got a telegram. It said, gorgeous, only you can understand. Could you? Oh, I still can. Can you? Certainly. Have you a handkerchief, Virginia? <laughs> My heart's broken, Miss Dove. <laughs> a broken heart is cumbersome baggage, Virginia. What can I do? I am not undecided as to how you should be answered, Virginia. But I am not convinced that this is my province. Oh, tell me, Miss Dove. Very well. First, you must return to your sister's house. You must enter your bedroom, fall on your knees, and give thanks to your heavenly father. Thanks for what? For preserving you from a fate worse than death. Death? Death. It is evident that the young man to whom you had given your affections discovered that his feelings for you had altered. He had, however, an honorable avenue of escape. He could have requested you to release him from his commitment. Instead, he proved himself a coward and a person of low principles. I thought there was something wrong with me. Your fault lay in rashness of judgment. His lay in dishonor. After you have expressed gratitude to the power that kept you from a disastrous alliance, you must consider your duty to your neighbor and yourself. You must find a useful occupation. Do you think I could teach? Decidedly not. But there are other spheres of service. Oh, I might be a nurse. You might. Good morning, Miss Dove. Good morning, Thomas. I thought I'd drop by for old time's sake. Why, Jensie, I didn't expect to find you here. Holy mackerel, kitten, you're all grown up. 
May I say you've done a mighty neat job of it? <laughs> Thank you. It's nice of you to approve. Now, the last time I saw her was before I went east to med school. I was being separated from the Navy and she from Cedar Grove, so to celebrate, she shot my brother Randy with a squirt gun in the seat of the... Virginia cannot enjoy being reminded of that, Thomas. Oh, I think it's cute of Tommy to remember. Does this room look different to you, Tommy? Yes, considerably. I expect the hospital keeps you busy, Thomas. Oh, I'm glad you mentioned that. It calls me right now. My car's outside if I can take you someplace. Oh, wonderful. Oh, goodbye, Miss Dove, and thank you. I'll remember. I'll, I'll think about my nursing career. Maybe Tommy can advise me. I'll advise her very carefully. I am 54. I won't have to retire until 67. If they don't tarry, and from all indications I don't expect they will, I could take their first child straight through to graduation. That child will meet me. Mrs. Green. Don't you remember? For night duty, you got a special order. Those dames like nothing better than to throw their weight around as far as us practicals are concerned. The least little thing, and they squawk downstairs. No, a small town's not my cup of tea. But I have a sister living here, and I was between positions and needed a rest. I only took your case as a favor to the superintendent. I'm interested in the theory of nursing. In my extensive training, I feel I'm wasted on the daily routine of the bedside. Not very uplifting. But you were napping when Mrs. Green left, and she thought when you woke up, you might want something to read. Everybody to his own taste. Can you think of a eight-letter word meaning a rare but endearing quality? I can. Humility. Hmm, let's see. H U. You're one hundred percent right. She always is. The latest for operating wear. Easy on the eyes. Well, did you think I'd forgotten you? No, Thomas. I just dropped by to see that you were being well treated. Any complaints? I am not pleased with this wall of secrecy. I should like to ask a few questions concerning my health. I certainly, but I'm not sure I can answer them. What do you surmise? I don't surmise. Tomorrow we'll do extensive tests. By Wednesday, I should be able to speak with some degree of conviction. Until then, Miss Dove, I shall expect you to assume the virtue of docility. Yes, Thomas. sorry that Miss Dove is in the hospital, but we're not going to let her down. We're going to go right on with our geography work. I will take her place. <laughs> now, we're all members of the same team, and our quarterback has been injured in scrimmage, and I'm going to go in and sub for her. Now, I'll call the same plays she would call. Now, of course, I don't know these plays as well as you do, so when I'm off sides, I want you to let me know, okay? Okay! And we're all in there pitching together? Yeah! Nice of you to drop in, Dr. Baker. I was only admitted two hours ago. I know, kitten, but I've been pretty busy. Oh, really? Then don't let me detain you. Fortunately, I have my own physician. He'll keep you well informed of my progress. If I know Sam Tiddle, he will. That's why I can put you out of my mind. Why, Tommy Baker, of all the callous, inhuman, heartless, have you forgotten that I'm in this hospital to have a baby? Your baby, our first baby. No, I haven't forgotten. I've been thinking about it all morning. I'm the happiest, luckiest guy in the world. But by what a narrow squeak. How much she had to do with it. How much who had to do with it? Miss Dove. A terrible Miss Dove. Without her, there'd have been no Thomas Baker. No beautiful Mrs. Baker. No little who's it Baker. What did she have to do with it? 
Her time in the South Pacific after my ship was bombed. Floating for days in that raft, no food, no water. She was right there with me all the time. Giving me the same fishy stare she used to give me back in the geography room when I needed a drink of water. So to make my supply hold out, I pretended I was back in old Cedar Grove. Even when the water was gone, I kept on pretending. I'd think, a bell will ring in a few minutes. You can last a little longer. Well, I lasted. She picked me up and gave me a medal. She rated that medal. Tommy, is anything awful the matter with Miss Dove? I'm due back now for more tests. We won't know till tomorrow. Don't worry about me, Tommy. Don't give me a thought. I'll look after little who's it. talk. Until then, I want you to put all this business out of your mind. Thomas, now we mustn't worry about tomorrow. We must do like Dr. Baker says. Goodness gracious, it's a regular greenhouse. I am deeply appreciative, but there are far too many. Restraint is the better part of beauty. I will keep the white azalea. Please dispose of the others. Yes, Miss Dove. But what'll I do with them? There must be less fortunate patients who would enjoy them. Shall I take them around to the wards? Please do, Mrs. Green. Okay. I went up and down the halls, giving cheer where it was needed. Oh, I saved the cards and I borrowed some stationery. If you'd like me to write the thank you notes, I'd be glad to. That would be obliging. Will you dictate them? No, use your own discretion, Mrs. Green. Only avoid the fulsome. Uh, yes, well, I was going to say the same thing to everyone. Uh, listen and tell me what you think. <clears throat> Dear Mr. Porter, at the request of Miss Dove, I am advising you that she is thrilled to death by your florial offering. The sympathy of friends brings sunshine to lonely shut-ins. I remain graciously yours, Billy Jean Green, R.P.N. What does R.P.N. stand for? Uh, a registered practical nurse. I made that up. But how's the letter? It is very, very genteel. Oh, gee. Honest, Miss Dove. You know, Miss Dove, I'm not really... Mrs. Green. I took the name for little Ava's sake. I was way out there in Detroit. Virtue knows no frontiers. I was on a night shift. Got me all mixed up. I I'd never been anywhere before. And, and you remember, Miss Dove, how I wasn't very mature. I do. All the fellas wanted to take me out. I, I guess it went to my head. There was this one fella. I didn't know he was married. He was wonderful to me. Anyhow, before I knew it... There is no need to elaborate. Oh, he was so good-looking and, and big, and, and I was so homesick. You know how it is. I do not know how it is, but I know that right is right and wrong is wrong. Well, anyway, to make a long story short, little Ava came way out there in Detroit. 
Oh, I could have given her up for adoption, of course. There was even a childless couple who offered me $4,000, but, well, she was mine. Besides, how did I know strangers would raise her right? Well, anyway, I, I brought her home, and I, I told that tale about my husband passing away. And why did you confide in me? On account of what you said about the letter. I'm nowhere as near as genteel as you thought, Miss Dove. And I couldn't deceive you any more than I could Bill Holloway. William Holloway? He was the one I mentioned formerly going steady with. The one who gave me the country garden perfume. You and... and William Holloway? When he bought me a ring, an engagement ring, it just all came out. He's like you. person you tell the truth to. That's what stopped me back there a minute ago. He said your very words. Right is right. Wrong is wrong. He wanted me to keep the ring as a gift. But I handed it right back to him. Let him keep it for, for somebody more fitting. Well, knock me for a loop I won't ever recover from. But I guess I'm one of those that have to learn the hard way. Just about time for her nibs. You're special, I meant to say. From the third grade. It's Cedar Grove. The work is Lord of Lenite. You may place it on the dresser. Isn't it sweet? When do you think we may expect Dr. Baker? Now, now, we're not to worry. Remember, no news is good news. Maybe that's him now. Miss Dove's room, Mrs. Green speaking. Who? I will inquire. Two out-of-town visitors would like to pay their respects. One telephoned to ask permission. The other is waiting in the lobby. Who are they? Well, they're not birds of a feather, as the saying goes. One is Mr. Maurice Levine, the famous New York stage play writer. The other is Fred Makepeace. I suppose you know where he resides. They are my former pupils. I shall be glad to see them both. Miss Dove will see them both. What? Mr. Makepeace was so sure of his welcome, he's already on his way up. Now, I don't hold with giving a dog a bad name, but neither do I believe in taking chances. Good morning, Miss Dove. How you do? How do you do, Frederick? Do you know Mrs. Green? Hi. Uh, you may be seated, Frederick. I'm not over the hill on the lamb or anything like that. Well, what I mean is... When I read you were sick, I went to my gang boss. I said, boss, the only teacher that ever learned me anything is in the hospital. I want the day off to go visit her. And he gave you leave? The green light, just like that. Why, sure, Fred, he says, I know I can trust you. I am gratified to hear that. Maurice Levine, Miss Dove expects me. I'll come right in, Mr. Levine. How are you, darling? Miss Dove. Quite comfortable, Maurice. But these are for you. How very thoughtful. Thank you. Recall the face, Rab? Uh, Fred Makepeace. <laughs> <laughs> You're a fan, kid. You're a press agent. And do I swell up when I hear your name mentioned by Winchell and Ed Sullivan and read it in all them New York columns? Well, thanks, Fred. <laughs> and do I lay it on with the guys out at the joint, too? Oh, really? Yeah. You made it, kid. And when I hear some commie jerk but little in this country, I say to him, just look up my pal Rab Levine and ask him if he doesn't think the good old USA is still a land of opportunity. Uh, the best, no doubt about it, Fred. But I also found that terrible Miss Dove. Miss Dove, this is Maurice Levine. I am glad to know you, Maurice. 
Maurice is 11 years old. His credentials from the school he attended in Poland would ordinarily place him in the fifth grade. But he knows no English, and in my opinion, he would pick it up quicker if he went through all the first grade classes. I shall seat him in the L section. Thank you, Miss Duff. The class will begin. The tiger belongs to the cat family. Cats are noted for their cleanliness. Maurice, this is a tiger. T I G E. Oh. Yo, yo, mir haben gerade ein Tiger in Wasch vergolten. Er hat geheißen Sultan. Er ist gewinnt sie ihr Stolz und Schein. Und sie ihr Schreck auf der Pferde. Aber einmal, er will gesehen, wer hat gewaschen sein Hund. Hund wie my mama's out the cards. Thank you, Maurice. I am sure that was most interesting and informative. When Maurice knows our language as well as his own, we will ask him to repeat it. Oh, Mrs. Rabbit was a widow. She earned her living by knitting rabbit wool mittens. She also sold herbs and rosemary tea and rabbit tobacco, which we call lavender. When no one was looking, she would also smoke a rabbit cigar. I have no recollection of Mrs. Rabbit indulging in any such vice. Is that on the page you were reading? No, Miss Dove, but it seemed funny to me if she did. You will adhere to the text. Continue, Maurice. Yes, Miss Dove. She had four children, Flopsy, Mopsy, Cottontail, and Peter. Here comes that new kid. Sicky, wizzicky, boo! Sicky, wizzicky, boo! Come on, gang! Fred! Tommy! What's the matter, Tommy? Why don't you let him alone? He didn't do nothing. Well, oh, come on, Tommy. It's just for the ducks. Good morning, boys. Good morning, Miss Dove. Good morning, Maurice. Good morning, Miss Dove. I am slightly encumbered this morning, Maurice. Would you mind carrying my books? home of the Jews, a country we hear much about in church, but of whose sons and daughters we know very little. To study a people and their customs is valuable, but to know a people and their customs is a privilege seldom attained without the luxury of travel. The fifth grade is to be rarely privileged. I have your parents' permission to take you to a traditional Jewish feast. Mr. and Mrs. Levine have graciously invited you. We're going to Rab Levine's house? We are going to the home of Maurice's parents. And may I ask Alexander why you refer to Maurice as Rab? <laughs> we, all, we all call him that. It's short for Rabbi. Maurice has progressed during the few months he has been here. But not to that extent. Rabbi means teacher. It was so that Jesus was addressed by the multitudes. There sure is a swell party. Hey, he ate 17 of those little girls. They're like ducklings, only better. But the matzo balls. I bring more, much, much more. For me, too. For you, too. A most successful evening. I feel much has been accomplished.
started writing you, Maurice, to thank you for the orchid and the plane ticket and the privilege of being present at the opening night of your play. What happened to you? Why didn't you come backstage? I returned on the midnight plane. It was imperative that I be in my classroom the next morning. Boy, what a kick that must have been, huh? Seeing old Rab's name up there in electric lights. I bet you was were proud. As Maurice's former teacher, I was gratified by his worldly success. Ouch. Then you didn't think too much of my play. I am not a critic, Maurice. But with more than 300,000 words at your disposal in any unabridged dictionary, it did not seem necessary for you to permit your characters the use of expressions that were frequently inelegant, often profane, and unless I misinterpreted their meaning, occasionally improper. Thank you, Miss Dove. Uh, next time I'll, I'll try to be more uh, meticulous. Discriminating. Yes, Miss Dove. Well, what gives with you these days, Fred? <laughs> I guess you don't get the courier no more. I'm on the roads. Acting or selling? <laughs> <laughs> Mostly digging with a pickaxe. Well, you seem fit and happy. It must agree with you. Well, sure. Plenty of exercise, good plain food, 12 hours sleep each night. Frederick Makepeace is paying his debt to society. Oh, I see. No big caper, Rab. I just got in a jam and had to pass a little paper to tide me over, which would have been nothing if I hadn't borrowed this convertible from a parking lot and happened to wreck it. Well, life can be rugged. Ah, uh, not too. The judge would have let me off with a fine and an SS, a suspended sentence. <laughs> but I didn't know where to look for the dough, and probation never really sent me. It makes me nervous. Yeah, I can imagine. Sure, it ties you down. You can't make plans. So I decided to do the stretch. I only got six months left. Well, how come you're on the loose? Well, Frederick was paroled for the day on his own recognizance. Oh, well, fine. Then you're free for lunch. As a bird? Well, it'll be old home week. Sandy Bird and I were meeting at the club. The club? Uh -huh. Oh, am I living? <laughs> Sorry to intrude, but it's official. Police Officer Holloway begs to intrude. Please come in, William. Good morning, Miss Dove. I hope you're improved. I appreciate your good wishes, William. Uh, excuse me, Miss Dove, but it's getting a little uh, crowded in here. If you don't need me, I would greatly enjoy breathing a fresh breath of air. Hiya, Bill. Long time no see. Look who's here. Rab. How are you, Maurice? How are you, Bill? Say you're looking sharp. Yeah, don't he, though. Once a Marine, always a Marine. Say, uh, Rab, Sandy, and me are having lunch together. A little uh, class reunion, you might call it. I'm afraid it'll have to be postponed, Fred. There's a matter of conflicting business. Is it urgent, William? Yeah, well, why don't you join us? You cops eat too, don't you? A most practical suggestion, William. Later, you can discuss your business with Fred as you drive him back to his present habitation. You mean you think that's a good idea, Miss Dove? I do, William. It will eliminate Frederick's having to seek other means of transportation. Yes, Miss Dove. As usual, right on the beam, Miss Dove. Would you go for a steak? With lobster on the side. Goodbye, Dal. And thanks. Thanks for the works. Goodbye, Maurice. Be seeing you, Miss Dove. Oh, hey, look at me. I almost forgot. From the joint, homegrown, handpicked by me. Then thank you, Frederick. William, will you ask the floor nurse to send Billy Jean to me, please? Hey. Yes, Miss Dove. Now I read the face, Billy Jean McVeigh. You mean she's now a nurse? An excellent nurse, Frederick. Kind, courteous, efficient, genteel. I have been most fortunate. Yeah, sure. Baker will be here in a few minutes. I want things to look pretty fine. Now I'll just go out and get us some nice, cold, fresh water. The patient is a slender, normally developed female, aged 55, showing few of the usual senile changes lying quietly in bed in no apparent distress, alert and collected. I'm surprised. I trusted you. 
I am guilty but unrepentant. What I read has restored my sense of personal identity. Now you listen to me. A chair for Mr. Porter. I am not here in a private capacity. I represent Rotary. Indeed. Indeed, yes. The Liberty Hill Rotary Club has voted unanimously to assume entire financial responsibility for your illness. Wh wherever you choose to go for this operation, Mayo's, the Johns Hopkins, the Leahy Clinic, uh, Rotary is behind you. And if I decline this kind offer? And, and who are you to decline it? Who gave you this right to, to walk the world with a, with a haughty spirit, frightening little children, turning men to stone? My dear sir, if you wish my attention, you must employ a civil tone. I am not to be bullied. Uh, bullied? You, you talk of bullying. She's always been a stiff-necked termagant. Do, do you think my pride hasn't suffered, seeing the daughter of my best friend practically penniless, working for her bread, wearing outlandish clothes? A civil tone, if you please, Mr. Porter. You have forgotten yourself. I have forgotten nothing. I haven't forgotten that I made you a very civil offer once. Fifteen years ago, to be exact. I, I've been a widower for, for a year, rich but lonely. Even then she was an old maid. Lonely too, but far from rich. The offer was generous, but nonetheless ridiculous. I shall ignore that final insult. Because it cannot blot out the memory that once, consciously or unconsciously, you did something that placed me in the untenable position of being forever in your debt. Nothing. I'm withdrawing every penny to be exact 6,572 bucks. And since your transaction will undoubtedly take a little time, Mr. Prouty, and mine will be brief, I'm certain you will extend me this small courtesy. Are you nuts? I've been here since one... Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, Mr. Porter. Good afternoon. A pleasant day for February. Yes. Miss Dove. A distinct touch of spring in the air. Miss Dove. May I borrow a pen? Mine has gone dry. Mm, of course. Thank you. I'm sorry, Mr. Porter. By some strange coincidence, your pen seems to lack ink, too. You're looking well, Mr. Porter. I had heard that you were suffering from a mild case of lumbago. Thank you. It's been a bad month for the colds. So much unseasonable weather might account for it. For deposit to my account, Mr. Porter, the entire amount, $98. Thank you, Mr. Porter. Thank you, Miss Dove. You can't do this, Porter. You'll not get away with it. Mr. Prouty, do you expect Mr. Porter to violate a federal law? This is a federal bank. He is compelled to close at 3 o'clock. You and I, Mr. Prouty, all of us here in Liberty Hill, will live to see the merit of this law. intended me no offense, but I am not an object of charity. It, it isn't charity Liberty Hill offers you. It's, it, it's respect. That I shall accept with unqualified pleasure. And now, Thomas, will you
you be more specific as to your findings? Well... You have a small growth on your spine, which must, if possible, be removed. If possible? If possible. Until we go in, we can never be certain about the nature of any tumor. All you have to decide is who shall remove it and where. Aren't you competent? I think so. But there are surgeons with much more experience and reputation. So if you decide to go elsewhere, it won't be interpreted by me as a reflection on my ability. The club can charter a plane. There's a very famous man at the Mayo Clinic. Allow me to deliberate. I remember that you had very skillful fingers, Thomas. You have very skillful fingers. Do you think you can put it back exactly as it was, Thomas? Yes, Miss Dove. I... I, I did it once before. Then do it again. Yes, Miss Dove. I shall feel perfectly safe in the hands of Thomas and Billy Jean. Now that the air is clear of emotion, we can resume our discussion. What do you propose? Let it be done tomorrow. As you used to tell us that I know what I used to tell you. What is the procedure? This is what will happen. This evening at eight, you'll swallow a capsule. You'll sleep soundly. So soundly that the next morning, when you're given a hypodermic, you may not even know. Certainly, you won't care or shouldn't. You'll be taken to the operating room and put under general anesthesia. Because of the position of the tumor, the operation may be lengthy. In that event, the anesthetic will be prolonged, and so might its after effects. It may be well into Friday before you finally awake. Where? What? Where will I awake? I don't know, Miss Dove. Open the top drawer of the bureau, Thomas. Give me my bag. father's watch. No, Miss Dove. I should like you to take it now, Thomas. It is bequeathed to you in my will. If... If on Friday I awaken here, you may return it temporarily to my custody. put up with this cuticle of mine. You have the same trouble? I have always considered the care of the nails exclusively a boudoir function, and certainly not a very stimulating topic of conversation. Well, I beg your pardon. I'm not supposed to be up, but I simply had to know how you were feeling. There have been some recognizable developments, Virginia. And you? Oh, glory. Like the night before Christmas. This time tomorrow, we'll know what it looks like, if it's a boy or a girl. Well, better go now. Good night, Miss Dow. Roses in your pillow. Good night, Virginia. Hello, Miss Dow. 
Dr. Temple, would you be writing to your mother tonight? Why, yes. Yes. Then will you kindly inform her that red ants have a flavor not similar, but exactly like sour pickles? They do? Did a bear tell you? No, Dr. Temple. I ascertained the fact for myself more than 30 years ago. You did? How? I ate one. <laughs> well, good for you. I won't wait to write, Mother. I'll send her a wire. I'll leave you with your pastor. Thomas told you? Yes. I do not wish to die. Life, whatever others may think, has been for me... I... I have been happy. I know. Thomas is not very hopeful, is he? Well, there is a hope which transcends the medical. Perhaps if we read from this... Do you intend to read the general confession? Yes. Then I must warn you that when I repeat that prayer, I do so with reservations. Reservations? I have made many mistakes. Perhaps even sinned. I admit my human limitations. But I do not, in all honesty, find the burden of my sins intolerable. Nor, Alexander, have I strayed like a sheep. As Frederick Makepeace might say, I have never been A-W-O-L. Well, I grant you that the language of the confession is archaic, but it contains more than the core of truth. All of us... No, I have never spoken hypocrisy to my maker, and now is scarcely a propitious moment to begin. But we can have a prayer, if you like, silently, but together. That I should like. Parson and the copper in the lobby. Potential blood donors. Good. Okay. Okay, Tommy. All right. Hey, you got the time, pal? Ten after ten. But what do you care with six months added for that stroll you took yesterday? Would you call a friend of mine in Liberty Hill named a Rab, uh, Maurice Levine? Only cost you four bits, which I'll pay you. Then reverse the charges, huh? This guy's loaded. Get back to your dig and make peace. You're fresh out of privileges. Uh, boy, am I paying my debt to society. I'm calling a play of which our old quarterback might not approve. But Cedar Grove Elementary School is suspending classes for the day. It's more extensive than I thought. Have Holloway and Burnham stand by. She'll need blood, and plenty of it. Yes, Doctor. What are they doing up there? Or, or don't they know? Oh, Mr. Porter, you know Tommy's doing his best. Now, now let's stay patient and, and full of fortitude. Uh, you two just sit tight, and I'll take a little snoop around.
How's it going, Miss Rice? Dr. Baker sent a frozen section to the laboratory. The report hasn't come back yet. She's had one transfusion. There'll be more. Do you think there's a chance? A nurse has permitted no opinions, Mrs. Green. Children aren't allowed. What do you want? We're here on important business, a matter of life or death. I was elected spokesman. I'm supposed to talk. Then go ahead. We came to give blood to Miss Dove. Dope. They don't do it down here. First they lay you down, and then afterwards they give you tomato juice. Well, not to folks your age. But we're all more nine. And we're yeah. real strong. Yeah. Oh, honeys, we don't need you. We got all these grown-ups waiting right here. But I'll tell you something you can do for Miss Dove. For instance? The state geography tests that are coming up this week. If she should hear that you flunked them, she'd be good and mad. She'd be terrible. Now, you go on home and study up. Oh, oh we know on. that old junk yeah. backwards. Yeah. yeah. Oh, are you sure? Sure. 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 What's the difference between longitude and latitude? Name the Great Lakes. What's the chief product of Kansas City? Where's the Tropic of Capricorn? Whatever happened to Cleopatra? Oh, oh, there you see. You handle that like a seasoned diplomat, Billy Jean. She herself, Miss Dove, I mean, couldn't have handled it more genteel. Take over. Me, how did it go? Oh, come on, girls, break it up. Let's pull ourselves together. Oh, I give up figuring out women. Yesterday, they were clawing Miss Dove apart. There wasn't anything she ever did right. It was a terrible Miss Dove. <laughs> and now look at him. Oh, shut up, Joe. And you, too. You weren't brought up at Liberty Hill, and she wasn't your teacher. And if she had been, you wouldn't have the repulsive habit of chewing your necktie when you have something on your mind. Yes, yeah, she'd have broken you of that the way she broke me of chewing my pigtails. And I was counting on her to break our Susie of chewing hers. What comes back to me plainest is the day I told her she was nuts. I guess you young fellas never knew she kept this town from going bankrupt. Oh, why don't they tell us something? That's what I like to know. We pay taxes, we got a right to know. Yes, sir. They say they're waiting for a report from the laboratory. Laboratory. That's passing the buck. If young Dr. Hurley... We just heard the from case, the laboratory. The report won't be completed until tomorrow morning. So you folks might just as well go home. I'm sorry. Oh, cut it out, will you, Bert? Things are spooky enough around here tonight. No calls, no fights, no wrecks, no dogs barking, no nothing. And you're no eye-opener, neither. You don't even know her. Sure I know, Miss Dove. I've been here more than two years, ain't I? I'll be sorry to see the old girl kick off. But if you ask me, I don't think she cares much. She couldn't have had much of a life. Never married, no family, no kids, never went nowhere. Why, they tell me she's never been more than a couple hundred miles from this burg since the day she was born. That's right. But she's been places you and I never heard of. She's been more times around the world than you can count. How much of a life, huh? No family, no kids. No kids? 
Boy, you're really off your rocker. Kids, she has a thousand of them. <clears throat> Police station, Mitchell speaking. Oh, hello, Warden. Hmm? Fred Makepeace. On the loose again? And you think maybe he's heading for Liberty Hill, huh? Yeah, sure thing, Warden. We'll be on the lookout for him. All right. Good night. I wonder what's the big attraction in this burg for a petty thief like Mike Peace. Well, I tell you. I don't know. Tell me, Thomas. Tell me, without wasting a word. They're full of beans. You'll have your hands full, Miss Dove. Sunday? Friday, Miss Dove. What a big day for Liberty Hill. Dr. Temple just gave the town the news. The news? That you're going to be all right. Gosh, that crowd's been waiting out there since the crack of dawn. There are people in the streets and more coming. Everybody and his uncle. I never saw anything like it, except maybe in the movies when a queen or some big shot takes a ball from a balcony. There's Mr. O'Neill, the mailman. And there's Ben Gordon, the station master, and, and young Dr. Hurley. Oh, and there's Ed and Pete from the service station. And good night, standing there, big as life, Fred Makepeace. <laughs> Frederick Makepeace. Oh, don't you worry, Miss Dove. Everything's under control. My bill standing right next to him. <laughs> Hey, look over there. Mr. Spivvy's carrying on like he just made a touchdown. <laughs> and every last kid from Cedar Grove. What did you say? The kids, Miss Dove. Your pupils. There's no school today. No school? But didn't you say that t this is Friday? Yes, Miss Dove. And the state proficiency tests will take place on Monday. Thomas, go down at once and inform Mr. Spivvy that the children must return to their classes. The fifth grade will review the winds and the tides. The fourth grade will memorize the products of the Argentine Pampas. The sixth grade will study the orographic control of rainfall. 
at once, Thomas. Good morning, Miss Dove. Good morning, Thomas. Mm -hmm. 